Hi everyone, welcome to Wool and Spinning. My name is Rachel. It is Tuesday, right? <laughs> it's Tuesday, March 5th, 2024. I can't believe it's March already. I just don't know where the time has gone. A friend of mine said to the, me the other day that she felt like this year was going really super fast. And I said, honestly, I feel like it's been like six or nine months of stuff that's happened in the last two and a bit months, but it's only happened over like two or three days. Like that's how it's felt. It's just gone like this. And <laughs> I don't know where the time is going. It's just been coming at us full throttle and it's been good stuff. It hasn't been like, you know, the kids, Nora's having an amazing season right now with soccer. She's just like on fire. She's playing so well. She's loving it. She's passionate about it. James has hurt his hamstring, but up till like this past couple of days when he hurt his hamstring, he's just torn it a little bit and he's foam rolling, you know, heat, all the kind of things. Um, up until that point, like he was just having a blast, really enjoying everything. So far, touch wood and blue, the kids have been mostly injury free. And, um, we had a couple of really great get togethers with some friends. After the wool circle last week, no, it was the week before. It was right after the live stream. It was the next day. The rest of the week went completely off the rails. A friend of mine had a cardiac event. I ended up over there until like 10 p.m. in the evening. She's fine, everything's good. Um, and then like coupled with that, she had a, a, a virus. And so the vertigo was really super terrible. So it's just lots going on with her. Lots of just, you know, emotional support. Just, you know, being a, being a, 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 a she's one of my closest friends. So just being a, a close friend, a good friend, best friend. So it's just been like a whirlwind of stuff. And then um, I was sitting there last night knitting and I'll talk about this later in the show. I was sitting there knitting on, on one of my projects right now. And like, I'm, I'm, like 75% of the way there in terms of being done. <laughs> I, I messed up the cables again. So I messed up the cables multiple times on this pullover, the snow crocus, and now I'm on another cable sweater and I've messed up the cables again. I'm just like, oh sweet mother of pearl. But this often happens to me when I get into these like sort of times in my life or like phases where I do feel really creative and I do feel like there's a lot of output, if you will, where I'm just doing a lot. And with that, there tends to be mistakes. I don't know why I've always been like that. And I end up going through these like, um, sort of stages where I'm feeling really creative and I'm feeling really inspired and I'm doing a lot. And then with that comes some mistakes. So I'll give you a hint over here of some of the stuff to come in today's show to talk about. This is the dread sweater that has the cable mistakes that I'll, I'll show you guys. Here are finished yarns that I've done in the last two weeks. So there is a lot to share with you guys and a lot to talk about. So what I think we'll do is we will run the credits so that I don't forget. I'll tell you a little bit about what's going on here in the community right now and then we'll get into uh, talking about finished yarn. A thank you to our sponsor, Brother Drum Carter. They are dedicated to giving you the very best of carding products with a focus on quality, affordability, and customer satisfaction. They are beginning to build mill processing equipment, so please stay tuned. Be sure to check out the new products on their website and follow them on Facebook and Instagram at Brother Drum Carter. I think you're right, Christine. She says in the chat, um, I think the cable gods are trying to tell you something. You're not wrong. <laughs> Cables are too hard. Um, 
All right, so what I'm wearing today, I'm actually wearing my Metamorphic. Um, this is my, it's a Metamorphic by Andrew Mowry. Um, this is 100% hand spun. It's got the, the uh, detail of the slip stitches down the side and the front. I did make the cropped version, which is kind of unusual for me. I usually like them my sweaters a little bit, but I knew that I wanted to put it with this uh, shirt underneath because I wasn't really wearing this shirt. Um, it's one of my cable uh, uh, collared shirts that I wear um, sort of layered in the summer when I'm trying to keep the sun off of my arms and my shoulders and so I tend to throw it on and the rest of the year it kind of sits in my closet and I just thought oh perfect colors so the yarns um the the creamy um gray uh it's it's actually quite a warm gray it almost has like a little bit of a purple undertone to it um it's a small bird workshop it was roving that I got from her and it was baby doll south down it was a, a cross um, for, uh, um, it wasn't a blend, it was a cross, uh, and it was blended with Tussa silk. And Catherine was actually wondering and, and had asked me afterward um, how I found the blend and whether it was actually really well blended. Um, there are places where there were kind of chunks of, of silk that were in it, but for the most part it was it was nicely done and it was just a really fast roving. I spun it you know quite a few years ago. And then the contrast color, and I don't know, probably it's better to show you. The contrast color is um was some of my favorite yarn that I've ever spun. Um, it was uh West Coast Color Falkland and it, I wish I sometimes wish that this sweater that you could actually wear it inside out because I actually love the the color of the yarn um, and if you guys are interested in learning more about this this sweater and this project and you want to see the original yarns before they were they were knit into this sweater I've just posted a link in the chat and if you're watching this later um, you can watch the live chat replay and the link will come up for you guys so that is what I'm wearing. All right, let's talk about what's going on in the community because there is a lot. <laughs> um, I'm having trouble keeping up and so I hope that you guys aren't totally and completely overwhelmed, that you're finding what you want, when you want it, where you want it. Don't ever hesitate to send me a message if you're wondering about trying to find some stuff or, or just sort of not quite sure where to access things. I'm always you know, happy to help people to uh, navigate all of that. So please don't, don't hesitate to ask. Um, Woolen Spinning Radio this month. I am so excited to put this out there. Um, that is actually not accurate what I have written there. It is actually, um, we we invited um, Suzanne, who is one of our community members. Um, uh, the, it's um, the importance of every day creativity with Suzanne and she is one of our community members she's uh, been an integral part of our community for a very long time and um, she uh, uh, shared with us this project that she worked on over the course of the last year so she had an opportunity as a an instructor at her uh, local college to be able to take a couple of semesters off and work on a project sort of a sort of like a sabbatical kind of idea and um, she shared her findings and she shared some of the things that she learned about the book list that goes with this uh, podcast episode is huge it is linked on patreon for you and wherever you get your podcast so Woolen Spinning Radio is available to everybody you can find it on Audible, Google Play, Spotify, iTunes it's everywhere so just just look for Woolen Spinning Radio and it'll come up and it's the most recent episode I think this was episode 103, if I'm correct. I might be, I might be wrong. Dion says I loved the radio podcast. Thank you, Dion. I'm so glad you enjoyed it. Ruth uh, put a very thoughtful comment on the Slack channel about the episode. I wonder if I can find it really quickly. She says, wow, just wow. This spoke so much to my personal experience with creativity and crafting, augmenting all other aspects of my life. Um, I'm not sure if I if this shares well, but I hope it does because I will be attempting to share it with family members and workmates. So she goes on, but um, uh, it does share well. You can um, share the links and they can find the episode anywhere they listen to their audio podcasts. As you guys know, over the next two years, we'll be looking at Sarah Anderson's book, The Spinner's Book of Yarn Designs. You can engage in three different places or all of them. Um, Spinning Pearls releases on Sunday. Um, most weeks, I've been sort of averaging one per week and then skipping the fourth Sunday 
just mostly to give people a chance to catch up more than anything. There is that much archived stuff to be able to share. So that's Spinning Pearls. If you're a Patreon member, it releases um, on Sunday nights. You'll see the post. And then the Wool Circle and Spinning Staples is run by my dear, dear friend, Rebecca. And uh, we'll talk about that in just a minute. Queries and Explorations is a separate group. They We meet on Saturday mornings. It's a group that's actually been running since uh, I think March of 2020 or maybe April of 2020. It was one of those two months. Um, and we are currently looking at joins. So we meet not this coming Saturday. Yes, we do meet this Saturday. We're gonna be meeting this Saturday and we're actually gonna be talking about joins on the spindle. The last two uh, gatherings together and meetings together, we've been looking at wheel joins and now we're gonna tackle spindle joins this coming Saturday. So uh, for anybody who's interested in kind of getting into the nuances of your spinning, so looking a little bit more at uh, your own individual spinning journey and, and um, questions that arise as you go through the process, uh, queries might be a place for you and you can always reach out to me and ask for more information. All right, so coming up in the year of yarn, that's what we're kind of calling our year, back to the basics, talk, um, using Sarah Anderson's book as a guide. Um, the wool circle, the next couple of weeks, we'll be looking at the drafts. So uh, this coming Tuesday, so a week today, Rebecca's gonna be looking at continuous backwards drafts, sort of that beautiful semi-draft that I'm known for, which is where you, you know, uh, draft back, smooth, draft back, smooth, or you can uh, draft back, and um, um, not smooth, just sort of reach, um, um, let go, pinch, draft, let go, pinch, and that gives you an even loftier, airier yarn. Um, I sort of do something in between where I don't really smooth the yarns particularly firmly. Um, I just sort of move back to the next spot where my, my next um, uh, point of draft is, and then I draft back, and then I kind of move back, but my hands are very light, light, light on the fiber. Um, and then episode 114, which will be the first week of April, she'll be looking at over the fold. So what's happened in March? I'm going to be really honest. March is always a very tricky month for us here um, at Casa de Welford. And it's because um, we always have spring break in here. The kids have a week off with portfolio reviews. They usually only are actually physically in school for two days which sounds like nothing, because it is, but James has actually already put in about two hours of schoolwork this morning. Um, so it's not that they don't still have their schoolwork and there isn't still that sort of uh, stressor on our life or that, that piece of our life, if you will. They're just physically home. Um, and this March, we decided that we were gonna take advantage of the two week spring break and we were gonna go away for the second week of the, of the two weeks, because it butts up into Easter. So the final week of March, there won't be any streams on Tuesday. So we'll bump the wool circle to the first Tuesday in April, and then everything will shift forward. And the reason we can do that is because April has five Tuesdays, which is very helpful. So there will be one wool circle this month and two live streams, and then April there will be three wool circles and two live streams. So thank you for being um, accommodating. I used to actually completely take the last two weeks of March off and not do anything and really take a step back. I used to do that in March and again in August and again in December. But I've kind of gotten away from that because the momentum of the community doesn't really allow me to do it anymore. So it's uh, um, I am I am going to take the last week of March, and so I just we won't have a stream that week. Um, and then spinning staples will be meeting on March 13th, and I I will send out the uh, the reminder email for you guys uh, next week, and uh, that'll be really great for you all. I think that's everything. So I have a lot of yarn to share with you guys. So let me just catch up on my notes here because I always have lots of notes so that I don't get completely derailed. I just realized I didn't tell you guys one more thing. I'm so sorry. The most important thing, the groups. <laughs> This is why I have notes. So spin group meets every Tuesday at 8 a.m. I'm so sorry I missed this morning, you guys. I was really hoping to get in, even if it's just for like half an hour. I really wanted to finish spinning um, this, which I'll talk about later in the show. 
but the, James just needed a bit too much help with his schoolwork, so it just didn't happen. But that's every Tuesday at 8 a.m. Pacific. Uh, the posts are, the, the links to these Zoom groups are all in the Slack channel. So if you're a member of the Slack channel, you are invited to all of these groups. Um, there is the European Spin Group on Thursday mornings. It is at 8, 8 a.m. Uh, London time, GMT. Uh, it's like midnight or 1 a.m. or something um, uh, Pacific. For those night owls out there, you're more than welcome to go. And then Fiber Prep and Weaving Group alternates every week. And actually, I think, if my memory is correct, I think it's Weaving Group this week. Am I right, you guys? Yeah, Weaving Group is this week. So um, hopefully you'll be able to come. Don't worry if you're not weaving yet. Don't worry if you don't have a weaving project that you're actively working on. You can just, um, you can just come. Now, what, the reason why I wanted to just take a moment to, to sit here for just a second and talk about book club was we are currently reading Fabric by Victoria Finley. Uh, we will be getting together to discuss that on March 24th on this Sunday. I don't think I'll be able to be there because I am in transit. We're on the ferry that day, but I might because we actually will be um, traversing Vancouver Island by the time this, like the group meets at 12 noon Pacific. Uh, we'll be driving. So if I have good enough cell signal, um, I, I hopefully will be able to jump in, even if it's just listening to the audio and, and jumping in a little bit. And then in April, uh, the 28th of April, Daughters of Nuri, I think that's how you spell it, or, or say it, is uh, going to be the next book that we discuss. So the, those are the next two books. Hopefully you can um, get going with them and be able to join us for, for book club. I am currently reading Cinder Nanny. It is completely Escape. It's by Soraya Wilson. I, my favorite book by her, if you like romance, is her, um, uh, um, The Chemistry of Love. Not Lessons in Chemistry, that's a different book, um, but Ke The Chemistry of Love. I really enjoyed that. And thus far, of all of her books that I've read, that one's my favorite. So if you've never heard of her before and you're just getting started and you're looking for a new author, um, uh, the Chemistry of Love, I would highly recommend. But I'm enjoying this too. It's okay. It's a bit slower of a start, um, but I'm, I'm enjoying it. Um, it's It's been okay. It's been okay. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with okay. So that's book club. That's all the housekeeping. I hope that that covers everything and that you guys are all caught up and you feel like you have a good sense of what's going on. Um, so let's get into some spinning. I'm only going to talk briefly about this first spin. Um, let's do that... Let's do that now. I took a big gulp of water. So if you could hear something in the background, that was me gulping. <laughs> All right. So I had shown you guys these a uh, couple, I think last episode, actually. I think I showed this to you guys at the beginning of the, sh of, of the month. Oh my goodness, it's the beginning of March, at the beginning of February. See, like, it's just, time is going too fast. So I found a whole bunch of bits and bobs when I was going through all of my stash, I was pulling out all of my bins and looking for all my stuff for cotton because um, we're doing a cotton um, uh, deep dive on the School of Sweet Georgia later this year. So I was looking for all of my cotton fibers and we were doing all the joins and queries and explorations. And so I was just pulling stuff out and trying to figure out um, where everything was because I did a big inventory and I put it on Google Sheets uh, back a couple of years ago now. And I've actually been pretty good about keeping it up to date. Um, but I've ended up with a few things where this was all in a Ziploc bag and they were... Um, it was just bits and bobs of stuff. There was a few things that ha I had saved that was from a workshop from last year that Diana twisted. And um, there was some fiber in here. There was BFL, sil um, BFL, BFL silk, uh, Corydale, Merino. I think there was some Cash Lux, um, which is a, a fiber blend that Sweet Georgia does. There was just like a whole myriad of stuff. There was some Wensleydale. Um, that I had thrown in at some point. And um, you can kind of see actually from this photo here, let me see if I can find it. Yeah, this photo here um, was all of the bits and bobs. So you can see that they were all sort of in the like magenta, 
purple and then that that green kind of vert green none of these colors are my favorite colors i know there are some in the community that these are like your absolute most favorite colors and you love them um they're just not I, I i tend to go more for the uh the browns and the sort of if you took all of these colors and added black a little bit of black and just bodied them right down like that would be that would be my 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 sort of what i what i love anyhow what what is going on <laughs> hello come back there we go. Um, so what I did was I actually took all of them because they were all the same colorway. They were all kind of part of the same, um, you know, they, they all had the same green. They all had the same purple. They all had the same blue, which is why a lot of them, why I had continued to add to the bag over the course of the days, months, years. I just kind of continued to add stuff that I had found that was like bits and bobs. Well, I ended up with quite a bit of fiber in there and I ended up with enough for two quite substantial bats. And so I split every single piece of fiber, every single one of these I split in half. I didn't weigh them, but I did, I, I did, you know, try to be as accurate as possible. And then I passed them through the drum carter once because I wasn't going to further blend them from there. I was going to leave them like this. This was after just one pass, but the problem with that is that the bat itself wasn't particularly smooth. So all these little mini nests, they didn't feel really smooth and they, they sort of needed quite a bit more um, pre-drafting. And you can see here that after another two or three passes, they end up so smooth and nicely blended and just beautifully prepped. And so I did put them through on the drum carter a couple more times to get this smooth prep. And I put them through after I had created those two big bats, one for each bobbin, a two ply. I did break the bats down into eights and to give me eight of these little nests for each bobbin. So I ended up with these um, in the end and it actually worked out really super well because they've been spinning up really super quickly. The color is quite gray and desaturated, which I really, really like. So on the bobbin, it looks really pretty. And um, the result was a bag full of sort of 16 of these little batlings. And I, I just sat down and started spinning them the other night and I got through six of the eight and almost finished my first bobbin. So really, really fast, just a really lovely use of time, a great way of spinning up some old stuff getting it out of my stash and having a fun spin to work on over the weekend because I was trying to finish my snow crocus. So that was kind of my priority was finishing up my, my sweater that's behind me. So really, um, really effective. So that's what's been, that's what's in progress. Um, my next spin is actually been skeined and is completely finished. And so we'll talk about what I'm planning on spinning next based on what I have um, finished um, spinning this past week. So let's talk about that next and we'll talk about all the yarns that I finished. You know, Rebecca said it's a super fun way to use leftovers and you know, it, 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 it's just fun, right? Um, there's no pressure. There's no plan. I have, I probably won't get really a lot of yardage out of it. So it would just be something small, an accent on a toque eventually, maybe some, you know, the, the contrast color and some mittens, just simple, simple, simple. I even thought about actually, um, three plying it. So after I spin the first bobbin, I was actually even thinking about spinning the other eight to the same bobbin and just chain plying it. Um, to get a three ply just to get something really round and to get something really nice but the reason why I wanted to share this with you was do you guys remember this little spin this little ditty that I showed you a couple I think I showed it to you last show and I was stripping it down into little nests and I think I it, eventually I think I stripped it down into eight strips and it was really compacted. It had been in my stash for a long time. I'm pretty sure this is West Coast color because it looks like her colors. Um, and it was tucked in the bottom of one of my bins. It was it was like really pushed down and, pre and just, you know, a little bit kind of fold from being mussed around a little bit. So I started stripping it down into eight and I dizzed this off of hand cards. And if you guys don't know about that technique yet, I'll show you photos later in the show. Um, 
with my next spin actually so you can get an idea of what that actually looks like but I took each of the lengths of those eight little nests so you know think about these but smaller this is from my mixed bat spin that I just showed you um, and I just tucked it into the hand card and started dizzing it just to open it up and, and to get it nice and aired out. Cause like I said, it was actually hard to strip down. It was, it was pretty, it was pretty compacted, but look at what I got. Look at this little guy. Isn't that pretty? Just a teeny, teeny, tiny little skein. I wound it off on my one yard, uh, nitty naughty. The colors came up really nicely. And um, James was playing with my camera. Not happy with him at all. And I feel like this is giving us not quite an accurate color as what we normally would get. Let me see if I can play with my, my, my lights a little bit here. Anyhow, that is... It came, I, I really, really like how this came up. I really, really like the colors. I like the look of it. Um, the feel is lovely. It's just a little two ply, um, but it's just got a lovely, lovely feel to it. it. It it came up beautifully in terms of like the airiness. Dizzing it really opened it up. It's just a little bit of fiber. Like it's just, it's not a it's not a lot. I don't even know what this weighs. I could weigh it. I have one of my scales right here. But it's just lovely and it, it took one evening, it took like an hour. I applied it from a center pole ball, so I spun it all up and then I um, and then I actually just left it to sit. Um, I just let the, the singles rest on the on the bobbin. There you go, it's 14 grams. 14 grams. Just lovely little. So like, you know, we need to take I, I, I sort of sat there thinking about it after when I pulled this little guy off. You know, we need to take the pressure off of doing like these really, really big spins all the time. Like this was just so, I don't even know what the right word is. It was very gratifying. I just, it was really enjoyable. Um, the next spin that I wanted to talk about, it, it yeah, it would be cute for color work mittens. Exactly, Dion. Yes, lovely. Oh, Mary Jo, that's lovely. Um, I'm going to have to sort the stash and make some lovely battlings like you made. Yes, I hope so. Or stripe it in a hat. Yes, all this stuff. It doesn't need to be all these big spins all the time. So from there, I felt really inspired and I had started to prep for this um, at the end of the, the right, right as we were streaming the last show. And this was actually the, the last little bit that was left over from this spin. So these are the, the, the leftover singles um, done as a chain ply. I'm trying to get the camera, there we go. Um, and so the chain ply, you can really see, sort of get a good idea of what the original um, colorway would have looked like in, in the fiber. But I did want to share with you guys what this originally looked like. So this is actually um, Bramble Ridge, uh, Longway Homestead. That skein spinning, here we go. Okay, so what I did with this was Why is this? That's so weird. Oh, there we go. Sorry, you guys. Oh, I am having a morning. It's because there's been so much going on that you know how you just sometimes feel like there's just too much and it's like overstimulating and you're you're seeing everything and you're looking at everything, but it's almost kind of coming in at like Mach 700. <laughs> like you're just like, whoa, slow down. Um, that's how I'm feeling today. Uh, I started the day off feeling that way and then the kids started fighting. Like they never fight like this anymore and they never really did, but they were really going at each other. And I was like, what is going on? Like, is there something in the water? I don't know. Anyhow, this was the original braid. I saw this at Knit City back in the fall. And for whatever reason, I just loved these colors. And Megan called it uh, scruff, meaning like the scruff of men's beards. So it's all the colors that she associates with men's beards. What I found really interesting as I was prepping this fiber, so this is the hand card. I, I was really surprised at how much of a pink undertone there is. And even in the finished yarn, like it looks very gray and it has a real kind of brown, um, uh, dirt brown kind of feel to it. 
but when I was when I had it stained after it was washed and I was photographing it and stuff it really has a very gentle pink undertone almost kind of a creamy antique pink not salmon but like Victorian pink almost. It's really interesting and you can kind of see a strip of it there in those nests that I've dizzed in the middle there where the gold is. You can see kind of that gentle pink and that comes through in the whole braid. It's gorgeous, it's so pretty. So my initial, uh, what I wanted to do with this was actually to spin a four ply. The only reason is because I haven't done a multiply for a long time. I love 100% BFL. This is not superwash, it's untreated BFL. I just love it. And um, so I took the braid, I obviously unbraided it. I stripped it horizontally four times. So that gave me four shorter strips of fiber. So I split it in half horizontally. So I had two shorter halves and then those two halves I split again. And the nice thing about that is then you're not prepping when you're doing this method, you're not prepping like, you know, huge, huge, huge long strips, which is what I dealt with and it's fine. I like to load it on a dis onto a distaff when I have a really, really super long amount of fiber. I did that for my orange and blue spin, which you can see when I show you the thumb every week, that's the yarn there. This is also Bramble Ridge yarn. And I did that and I stripped it um, so that it was a huge length where I just split it lengthwise horizont um, uh, horizontally. So rather than vertically, I split it horizontally down the whole length and then I took that one half and I and I put it through the hand card. So what you're doing is you're laying that fiber on the hand card and you thread the end with a diz and you literally diz it off and you keep moving the fiber down as you work your way through it. And what I really like about this is it creates this. So rather than sitting there and pre-drafting, so I've got these little battlings here, rather than sitting there and pre-drafting and doing it all manually, when it's being pulled through the diz off of the hand carter, because the hand card acts as, it's just anchoring the fiber, it's giving you something to pull against, which you're not really pulling, you're very, very gently um, pre-drafting. But what I find is unlike the hand pre-drafting method where, where you're sitting here doing it by hand with off of the hand card and dizzing it catches all the fibers. So when I'm pre-drafting by hand, I often find that not everything pre-drafts. There's always like, you know, a little spot that kind of gets left behind and you have to do it by hand once you get to that spot when you're spinning. Um, and I just find that the prep that I get by using the hand card method, by, by anchoring the hand card and doing this, the prep that I get off of it is so consistent. And it really blends. You can see here how blended the colors look. Like they just, there's lots of air in them. They have so much um, um, uh, loft to them and lightness, but it also blends the transitions of the color, which I really, really like. So I did not invent this method. Um, this was invented by Kim McKenna and I shared last episode some links to some new tutorials that she's got up um, with the School of Sweet Georgia. So this was it. I used all of my small bobbins that I have with my lace flyer on my Magicraft. I think I spun this on my Magicraft Susie might have been my rose though, but I think it was my Susie. And I used all of my smaller bobbins. So these ones here on your left are uh, what what are called the baby, baby, what are they called? I had it on the tip of my tongue. They have a fat core. Um, so the core is really big and the idea is that it resists, um, uh, it, it, it um, creates, um, uh, when the, when your singles wind onto the bobbin, there's less resistance. It goes on nicer. It's almost like there's already layered singles underneath, and so it just creates an, a, a a more enjoyable spinning experience. Basically, the the wheel doesn't know there's any difference, but you as the spinner feel a little bit of difference to have that slightly fatter core. And then the other ones are just straight lace bobbins, and they have a regular core. And so I you can obviously load a lot more onto those. I like both. If I were to buy some, I would buy the black ones, um, just because you. Can put more singles on more than anything so that was so i did the four um singles and you know 
I think it's really easy when it comes to multiply yarns to feel like there's so much more spinning. Like, oh, I'm gonna be spinning so much more, it's so much more to prep, so much, but it's actually not. You're just dividing up your singles differently. And so in the end, I finished off with a beautiful four ply yarn. I am so happy with how this came out. It's about 300 yards for 110 grams, um, which puts it solidly in sort of the, you know, sport light DK range. Um, it's about 16, 14 to 16 wraps per inch. It didn't bloom particularly after washing. It's not like it went poof or anything, not like this little guy did. Um, but that's the BFL. It's a longer, it's a long wool, um, even though it's shorter stapled than say something like Romney. But it, I don't find BFL tends to bloom a ton, but wow, is it lovely. It feels soft and it's just, it's a really nice yarn. I'm really happy with how this turned out. And of course, because it's a long wool, those tips are gonna start poking through a little bit. You can see already that there's a tiny, tiny bit of a halo. I would love to use this in the yoke of a sweater. 300 yards is, is just perfect for a yoke. Um, it would give me lots of leeway. I could even add a little bit to the cuffs and to the hem to use up what, what's left. But yeah, I'm really, really happy with this. Mike actually requested a new pair of socks. He needs a new pair of hand knit socks. Um, but he actually requested not hand spun because I think he worries about ruining them. He just feels like it's too much. He's like, if you had all the time in the world and hand spinning and knitting socks wasn't a big deal because you were churning out a huge amount of stuff, he's like, that would be great. But he's like, save this for something that's really special. Um, Cause he saw it and he's like, those aren't for me for socks, are they? Cause he knew that it wasn't super washed. I'm like, well, He's like, please don't. I think he worries and he knows that my, my making time is so, so limited. It's very kind of him. Obviously I don't mind doing that for him, but he, he's very conscientious. Yeah, thank you so much. You guys, Dion says that's a gorgeous neutral. I love Megan's stuff. Like, oh my goodness, her yarns, her dyeing, like she does such a beautiful job. I have to give her a little bit of a plug. I've recently started to get to know her a little bit better from these um, monthly gatherings that friends of ours, common friends of ours have been hosting, um, Angel and Jessica, and they've been, it's this knots and hops. So if you are in Vancouver or out in the Fraser Valley, look up on Instagram, uh, knots and hops. There's one for the valley and there's one for Vancouver proper. I think they actually maybe meet in North Vancouver, so it's not Vancouver proper. Anyhow, um, Megan and Angel and Jessica have been organizing them, but it's been a great opportunity to get to know Megan more. So she, another Megan, a different Megan. So Megan of Bramble Ridge, um, not Megan organizer of Knots and Hops. <laughs> um, it's been lovely getting, getting to know her and having an opportunity to work with her fiber because I had bought these three braids. I have one more. It's not here. It's in another room to spin up of hers, but it's been wonderful to try a new dyer and try something else out because, um, I don't buy a lot of braids and I don't work a lot from comb top, but it's nice to have somebody in your back pocket that you can rely on. So yeah, Mike's a keeper, that's for sure, Lisa. Oh my goodness, is he ever. <laughs> oh, you guys. So the last skein, you're probably wondering what this beautiful gray skein was that was next to everything. It is my Longway Homestead. So these are all of the Longway Homestead yarns that I have finished to date. So there are 12 in this installment in total. Um, I finished off getting them. I feel like I received mine sort of through 2020, maybe into 2021. I got the 12 and then I cut, I told, I talked about last time cutting open the vacuum pack, blah, 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 blah. And, um, I've spun up. This is my eighth, seventh, seventh, no sixth. See? <laughs> oh my goodness, you guys. Um, oh, Lisa, I'm so glad that you're in the same boat as me. She said she's been on the struggle bus today as well. I just, can we, can we be, can we be friends on, on the struggle bus together? I've spun five of these thus far. I've done the Tunis, the Rambouillet, the Rideau Arcot, the Wensleydale, and the Romney, which is here, which we'll talk about in a minute. And I also have done, what's the fifth one? The Rideau Arcot. Come in. Tunis, Rambouillet. I'm having trouble with this slideshow. It's not working. Here we go. 
Finn. That was the other one, Finn. Um, so I spun up all of those ones and I'm not working, I'm not going to work with any of these yarns until they're all spun. So it's almost kind of like a reward to finish them all off at the same time. The Romney I pulled out to spin. Um, what I love about how uh, um, Anna does Long Way Homestead, Long Way Homestead's located in rural Manitoba, um, outside of Winnipeg, and she um, includes these really cool cards with all of the monthly um, installments. It gives you a rundown of what the Romney sheep are all about, where they come from, uh, how they relate to and why she has them as part of her club, like part of the fiber installments. You only get 12 and then you're, it's not like an ongoing club year after year after year. And um, uh, so they were first imported to America in 1904 and they thrive in humid climates like the Pacific North, Northwest. So we actually have a lot of Romney here in British Columbia. Um, and, uh, medium to coarse to fine, medium coarse to fine is the wool range. Um, it comes in many varieties. The coarse wool is used, is great for carpets and sturdy outerwear. That was very much my experience with, with one of those bats that I did from Desdero years ago. And I knit it up into a cardigan. It's, it's, it's hard to wear. It's a little bit too coarse, even with a shirt underneath. Um, it's really prickly. It would have been great to spin fine and use in as as rug uh, a rug weft. Um, finer wools can be used in clothing, so it can felt, but the feltability depends on the fleece. And then she has some sort of averages: the average staple length, the fiber diameter, so that's your microns, um, your fleece weight averages between eight and ten pounds, and so on. So these cards are really helpful, and I've been keeping them as I've been spinning up my. Uh, each installment and then like I said I've been keeping each of these yarns and not working with them right away because I want all 12 before I work on any of them I've been spinning them all as two plies and I've spun them all as fine fingering weight yarns so all of them are being spun the same way and what I'm hoping is that at the end I'll have a collection of these 12 different breeds spun in the same way in terms of like a fine fingering but to be able to see the differences between each of them. So my plan is like I'll knit a swatch of each of them, have a little mini skein of each of them, and it'll keep um, like a record of, of having made all of these. This came out roughly sort of between 18 and 20 wraps per inch. I'm pretty sure, let me just double check. Might even be a bit finer. Yeah, it's closer to 22, 22 wraps per inch. What I did with this though, the Romney is, is long stapled and this was quite a long stapled uh, roving that you get from Longway Homestead. She has the mill and she does pin drafted roving and it was quite long stapled. And from being in the roving and that disorganized kind of um, uh, uh, prep, um, I could tell that for myself, it wasn't gonna be a really super enjoyable spin. So I actually did the hand card thing. So I did this off of the hand cards and I just kept weighing the pin drafted roving so that I would end up with approximately half of the pin drafted roving dizzed um, off the hand card to sort of realign it a little bit, create a little bit more of a smooth prep. It wasn't gonna be a true worsted ever again because I can't go back to the locks and realign everything and spin a true worsted. However, taking the time to realign, to sort of smooth out the prep a little bit and diz it off the hand cards was the difference between a yarn that I absolutely love, I love this so much, uh, versus a yarn that I probably would have been like, ah, oh, it's okay. So I'm glad that I took the time to do that. So uh, yeah, I did diz it off the, off the hand cards. I did about half, spun all of that to one bobbin, did the other half, spun all of that to one bobbin. And I mean, the pictures speak louder than words. The, the, the results are a lovely, lovely prep because those, those long Romney fibers sort of, they didn't realign in the sense of like becoming um, perfect you know, true worsted yarn again, but they did realign in the sense that it just smoothed them out. I was able to remove any sort of, um, you know, little bit of VM that was left, any kind of little naps or naps that had been sort of stuck um, in the fiber from the pin drafting process. Um, and I'm really, really happy with how this turned out. So beautiful yarn. I'm looking forward to the next one. I have six more to go. So 
Um, I can't remember which ones I have in my stash still to go. I think I have Icelandic. I know I have Targi because there was an apology with that one saying that she was really sorry about the amount of VM that's left in it. And it was because that particular clip from that particular year was um, just chock full of VM. But that'll come out in time. Um, I'm not too concerned about it. And then there was, uh, what are some of the other months? There was Corydale. I haven't done that one yet. Um, there was another, there was a couple other ones that were sort of downy that I haven't gotten to yet. So I'm looking forward to those ones. So I'll do, I have them all in one bin, all stored together. And when I finish one, I'm starting the next one. So hopefully I'll have another one finished for the next show or it'll be well on its way. So that's the plan and that's the Romney. So that's six out of, out of 12 done. I'm, I'm really happy with, with how those are coming out so far. So that is a lot of spinning that I've been doing over the last couple of weeks. And part of the reason for a lot of spinning is because we've been watching a lot of soccer, uh, because the, uh, women's, I'm going to mess this up. The gold cup is on right now. Um, I don't think you could use the lock pop Eve just because you've already got the roving. Um, and the tines are facing a different way. Um, if I go back for a minute and just have a look, like they're different tools. That's a really interesting question. Kind of don't think so. Let me see the photo. I have to find the photo again. Here it is. Um, cause on your hand cards, your tines are going upward and kind of, they're different too, right? Cause the tines on your hand cards aren't as they're not as thick, like they're not as stiff as on the, on the lock pop. I don't think you could diz off the lock pop, but it'd be, it'd be an interesting, um, thing to try. Uh, I, I just, I don't think you can. Uh, great question, Glenda. Will you prep the other long way homestead fibers the same way uh, on hand cards? I think that I will because I'm so happy with how this came out. Um, I, like I said, I think it took sort of uh, what would have been a mediocre yarn um, to the next level. Like it's just, it's so consistent, you guys. And that's, I, I yes, my spinning is very consistent, but the prep, the prep makes the yarn. Um, and I know we talk about that a lot in spinning and we talk about creating these amazing preps and sometimes it feels like such a huge time thing to, to, to spend a lot of time on, um, on creating these really great preps, especially cause it's like, well, I already got it. Like it's already prepped. Why do I have to prep it again? Or why do I have to do more? Can't I just start spinning? I know I used to feel like that a lot when I first started spinning, especially when life was really busy and I felt like I didn't have a lot of time to spin. It was like, now you want me to spend a whole bunch of time prepping? Like really? It makes a huge difference. <laughs> it makes an even a really big difference. Um, and it's not because the way that these fibers are prepped uh, aren't okay. They're, they're fine. They're good. Um, but man, when you just take that extra few minutes to do a little bit extra, whew, makes a huge difference, huge difference in your, in your finished yarns. So, um, there's my plug for today for, for taking the mo taking the time to do a little bit of extra prepping. All right, I'm just gonna move some stuff out of the way here just cause I end up with this huge pile of stuff and I get kind of, it's like too much. Um, I wanted to share with you an update on my capstone and I'm not actually sure the best way to share this, but I think probably the best way is if I just put it on. Um, this is my capstone that I've been working on. I have shared a lot about this yarn over the last few months. So I'm not gonna go back into sharing about it a ton just because we have talked about it quite a bit. Um, but this is my capstone yarn that I did the three parts. Uh, I just posted about it this past week on my Instagram profile. Um, it was, um, uh, one part, uh, red, one part blue, one part yellow, carded all together. And then I added in the white and, um, just for ease for Rebecca, for doing the transitions and putting up the timestamps and whatnot, before we get into talking about this knit, let me just uh, run the credit for it. Also had an itchy face so it gave me a chance to itch <laughs> so this yarn I'm actually gonna run out of yarn 
So this sweater is, let me just make sure I have the right name. It's the Field Day. Yeah, the Field Day Cardigan by Ozetto, um, who's also known, uh, her, her real name is um, Haley Smedley. And um, I, I cast off. So I did all of the ribbing over this past week and I was able to cast off the lower hem. She asks you just to do a regular bind off. Um, it's okay. I've kind of gotten away from just doing a regular bind off and a regular cast on. I've been using the tubular bind off and cast on quite a lot lately, which I really, really like. Um, but if I put it on for you guys, I don't, I've got a lot of layers on, so I don't know how this is going to go, but I'll put it over top of my hair so that you can see. The button band is knit at the same time as you are building the body of the sweater. And um, let me just stand up a bit here and I will show you guys. I did lengthen the sweater by about two inches. If I put it over my hair, then you guys can see. I did lengthen it by about two inches. The, the camera is blowing out because it, it wants to read it as white, um, but it actually isn't white. If I come in a bit closer, hopefully that's showing up a little bit better there. Um, but like I said, you, you knit the button band with the body of the sweater. It is a drop shoulder. This is going to block out to be quite a bit baggier than what it looks like right now. Um, there's quite a bit of positive ease. It's just grabbing onto the sweater underneath. And like I said, I'm wearing a lot of layers. And then you've got button holes uh, down the front of the sweater and buttons that will go on the other side, obviously, so that you can uh, you can button it if you want. Um, my friend Angel at Knots and Hops, she was wearing this sweater the last time we got together and I loved it so much. I saw it on here and I was like, oh, I know what sweater that is. And um, yeah, it's this sweater and she knitted in the yarn called for in the pattern and honestly you guys it just looks awesome. Um, so I, I did lengthen it a little bit because I love my oversized uh, orangey red cardigan that I bought in Portland back in June. Um, it's 15 inches long and it's quite big and it's quite oversized and I just love it. Um, and so I did knit it longer to kind of fit that because it comes right down that I, and I think that just, it, it works really super well. With the button band, the horizontal, um, sorry, the vertical button band, what you have to do at the back, and I'm not sure how I'm gonna show you guys this, but you have to, um, once you finish, you have to go back and pick up stitches and seam it. So if I pull this off for a moment, normally I would show this to you on, on my dress form, but as you guys can see behind me, um, Miss Diana is wearing my FO for this week. So, um, yeah, so then you just, um, you, you, you knit and then you have to seam all of this, um, afterwards. So I just have to do a little bit of mattress stitch, no big deal. And I do like the fit in the sense that you actually build up the back of the sweater, um, at the beginning. So you can see that you almost kind of end up with a back raglan kind of. This is all done with short rows. So this here is actually a seam, is actually a seam where you pick up for the front and then you keep knitting down. The only thing is that it creates your button, your, your arm, where the top of your, your shoulder seam is, isn't where you pick up. Uh, like it's, it's, this is back here, but the actual halfway point on the shoulder is up here versus down here. So I'm curious when I go to pick up stitches, what that's going to look like in terms of how that's going to fit in the shoulder. So um, I'll pick up the stitches and then I'll have to put it on my dress form to kind of see how it falls to make sure that I've got the, the stitches distributed properly on the drop sleeve. The nice thing is when this isn't curling in on itself and, and sort of acting up because it's not washed, it's not blocked and it hasn't had stitches picked up on it, it actually is quite far down my, my arm. It's like a true drop shoulder, which I really like. Sometimes some of the drop shoulders are a bit too high for me. I like them sort of like, if it's gonna be a drop shoulder, let's be a drop shoulder. Um, so it probably actually won't make much difference because you're just knitting straight until you get to the cuff. So really happy with this lovely sweater blend. Thank you, Dion, that's very kind. Um, I'm really happy with this. I, I'm tempted, I'm so tempted to go back and do a tubular cast off. For the bottom here just to make it really 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 nice um i'm tempted i'm so tempted 
And then in terms of leftover yarn, because I lengthened the cardigan by two inches, this is all I have left. Um, it's about three quarters of the third skein. So I will have to make some more yarn. So that's actually the next project for spinning. You know how I had said to you guys last show that I wanted to make sure that I always had some fun spins going on the wheel, spindles, whatever, all the time that didn't really have an outcome, that didn't have, they have to be big sweater spins, they didn't have to be for anything. It was just spinning for the joy of spinning. Um, so this, th once I'm finished this, this, I need more of this. <laughs> so I'm going to start working on the sleeves, get those well, well in like, you know, well on their way. And that will give me an idea of how much more yarn and fiber I need. Um, I probably need a second one of these. Um, so no big deal. I've got lots of singles left of the, of the white pole worth. I just need to make the, the, the capstone blend of the red, yellow, and blue and get it spun up and ply. No big deal. So yeah, tubular bind off, right? tubular bind off for the win. I know it takes more yarn, but if you're going to spend the time, it just, it would look so, it would look so professional, right? So thank you for saying that you guys, I appreciate it. I will go back and rip out. Um, you said the colors, but what is the fiber? Oh, good. Thank you. Thank you, Eve. So the white marl, um, if you guys give me one sec, I'll actually throw in a photo here so that you guys can see. It's probably best, I probably should have had this um, ready to go before, but to be honest with you, we've talked about this yarn quite a, quite a lot. And um, I always forget um, that sometimes like, it's just good to like remind ourselves um, of, you know, of these different, different yarn, different yarns, different fiber, fiber uh, components. So let me just make this fit. One sec, you guys here. I'm still here, but you can see all the things. Okay, so this was the yarn and these were the colors. So I had quite a few people asking me what the original base colors were. These were the colors. So as you can see, the yellow was a cool yellow. It almost kind of had a bit of a blue undertone. Um, the red was a warm red and the blue was a warm blue. And then this was the yarn. So I did equal parts, red, yellow, and blue. It was the RYB color wheel. And then I mixed those I, after I mixed those three colors, one third, one third, one third, um, I weighed that bat and I weighed out an equal p part of the white fiber. All of this was Coriadale. So these three colors are Coriadale and the white that I mixed with that singles was Coriadale. The white that I plied it all with was organic Polworth. So it's kind of a bit of a Heinz 57 kind of yarn. Yeah, tubular bind off is kind of scaring me, just like steaking. You know, I think I have really learned with all of this stuff, you just have to do it. You've got to keep practicing and you just have to do it over and over and over and over again because now tubular cast on and tubular bind off, no problem. But when I first started doing them a few years ago, I was like, what is this disaster? Because it just felt like they never worked out and it never looked really skookum and really good. Um, you just have to practice. Steaking is practice. Yeah. Um, yeah. Dion said the same thing. She's only spinning for enough project, uh, enough fiber for the project, no leftovers. So, um, if she has holes, it will be a decorative patch. <laughs> you shall do it. I, I hear you. I'm, I'm, what I'm hoping Dion is that I have about 20 yards left that I can put away in a little Ziploc bag so that if I get a hole, I can fix it. But yeah, I I'm done with a bunch of leftovers. <laughs> it's just, it's too much. It's too much. All right. The winter's beach cardigan. If you guys want to see this cardigan really quickly, um, it was this one here. It was not this one here. Wait, oh, this is field day. Um, so field day, this is what field day looks like when it's finished. So once it's washed and blocked and all the things, this is what it'll look like. And then, um, this is winter's beach. So very casual, cabled all over, pockets at the front, just a drop shoulder again. Um, um, nothing, it's, it's not super, super fancy. I, I was really drawn to it for that reason. So I started knitting on this and um, I've actually finished, well, I haven't anymore, I've had to rip it out, but I finished the body. I had it all three needle cast off and bound off and it looked like this, it was skookum. And I was looking at it and I was like, I just 
there's something wrong. And so I was looking at it more closely and I was trying to figure it out. And um, the photos coming up here in just a second, you'll see I the cables don't match up. So if you look at the cable at the back neck there at the back and then you look at the front, the front, it's they're not matched up. They should be matched up. And not only are they off, but it meant that the back neck, the, the part that was cast off around the back is way too big. Um, so if you look here, you see how it kind of swoops down at the back way too deep. It shouldn't be that deep and the cables weren't matching up. So basically what I did by accident was I, I didn't, I don't know what happened. I have no idea because it's clear as mud in the pattern. But basically, when I went to divide for the front and the back, um, I didn't take, you see how, okay, here, hang on. This is the right front and this is the back and this is your side panel. So instead of dividing halfway here, for some reason, I divided here. So it was like cable equals front. So therefore front, even though it's clear in the pattern and I followed the stitch counts and whatnot, but for whatever reason, I, I decided at the last minute that that didn't apply to me and I divided here. So all of this was on the back and none of it, none of like what? So I had to rip it all back. So I had to rip out the back, I had to rip out the front, I had to rip out all the three needle bind off and I've start, restarted and I was working on it yesterday and I was like, oh, that's weird. I'm just shaking my head. If you don't laugh about this stuff, you guys, honestly, like life is too short. If, if you get really upset about it and really wound up about it, like it, it you know, I'm, it's like, it's just stuff. It's, it, yes, it's time, but I still would have knit regardless, you know, um, so I can't get myself too wound up. Um, but you can see how the beautiful, I call them Oreo cables. I know they're not supposed to, that's not what they're called, but to me, they look like Oreos. Um, I realized that this one was crossing at a different rate from this one. It was like, why is this one going out and this one's going in? Oh, it's because I have a mistake here. So what I did last night, cause I was right in the middle of something and I couldn't fix it right away. I just started knitting these straight and I'll rip back down and fix all of this. Um, probably later today and be so that I can keep on going. So that was the big cable fix. <laughs> I was like, seriously, you guys, <laughs> universe cables. You're right, Christine, about saying that like, yo, the universe is trying to tell me something about cables. So I fixed the, the counts for the front and the back. I divided properly this time. So I grabbed the nine stitches from the, from the side seam that I needed. And yes, I have nine stitches on the back. <laughs> <laughs> and it'll be fine this time. But I was like looking at it and I was like, this doesn't, this isn't right. Like there's something wrong. And then I was looking at the cables and I was like, do other people's cables match up when they bind off? Cause it's supposed to be like this. Like the cables are supposed to look like they keep on going. Like it's supposed to be seamless, right? Like, I don't know what I was thinking. Uh, so that is my winter speech. It's not on timeout. I was gonna put it on timeout, but I only have it and my uh, capstone that I'm working on right now. And I, you know, I started these three sweaters. We're gonna talk about snow crocus in a minute. We've all done this. You're right, Christine. We've all been there. We've all done it. Um, it's 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 sort of one of those things where I started these three sweaters kind of roughly at the same time. It was like bang, 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 cast them on. And now two months later to have one cast off and the other two so close, there's like this momentum of just keeping on going. It's almost like getting the attune shawl finished gave me some momentum to sort of keep on going and to get some of these bigger knits done. You know, and I had finished off, I have to write up the pattern, but I, you know, I'd finished off my, my new toque pattern, the wraps per inch ribbed toque, Yes, it has a cable, cable, tubular cast on. Um, and, and it just, yeah, it just sort of gave me some momentum of like, let's, let's go, you know, let's, let's do the thing. So let's talk about snow crocus next. Cause we're, it's after 11. I can't abandon the kids for too, too, too long. Um, and I'm excited to share a little bit about this sweater with you guys and some of the things that I learned.
That is the worst. Christine says she remembers a sweater with a cabled yoke from the mid 1980s where she crossed one cable the wrong way and didn't notice it until she'd sewn it up and added the neck band extra. Did you just leave it? I mean, some, some people out there like Kay Facet, he says you should put one mistake in every project to keep yourself humble. Um, and to remind yourself that the, this is handmade. I, I'm curious, uh, let me know, yeah. Um, Rebecca says, same thing happening with my book project done. I'm on a sweater blitz. Yes. Um, you know, it's funny. I went through a phase there for quite a number of years where I didn't do any cable anything. Um, and then all of a sudden I've ended up with these two cabled projects back to back. And it's kind of funny how that goes sometimes where you just end up, you know, for whatever reason, feeling really inspired by a certain pattern, wanting to, loving a certain aesthetic, you know, whatever it is. Um, and then you end up with a whole bunch all at the same time. So this is snow crocus and um, it is a pattern not for the faint of heart. Um, I have an end sticking out right here that's going to bug me if I don't trim it. It's like right smack here. There we go. All right. Let me tell you first about the yarn. It is Cascade 220 Heathers um, in my favorite, favorite color of all time. It's called Sand um, and it is the Cascade 220 Heathers. It's not the solids um, because I think it's the Heathers that really gives the overall kind of look, if you will, of just being, it, it just looks gentler um, being being the, the, the Heathers. It's, it's got that slightly, a little bit more depth, a little bit more interest. The yarn that I held with it for the uh, Kid Silk yarn is Drops, Garn Studio Drops Kid Silk. I used four skeins of that and I do have quite a bit of the third skein left over of the ball. And you know what? I can't actually remember off the top of my head. I'm going to look it up just because I don't want to um, not be accurate, but I think it's yeah, so if I had used all four balls, it's 920 yards. Um, so I used three and a half. So of the, I have a lot of this sand color of the Cascade 220s in my stash because I had bought it for a big jacket type cardigan years ago that was a Brooklyn tweed pattern. And I still have two full skeins of that left. And I think I have something like six or eight of those in my stash, but they had gotten attacked by those pantry moths that I've been dealing with and um, so a couple of the skeins got wrecked and then there's two skeins left anyhow I think this used basically about 800 yards of yarn from start to finish so it's not a lot of yarn I knit the whole thing on five millimeter needles or US size eight but the ribbing I did on four millimeter needles US size six um, whether I would do that again or not, I'm not sure because it did make the ribbing really, really, really tight. It'll loosen up in time. It's a tubular cast off of both the hem and the cuffs, but it is, it is pretty firm. Um, and the ribbing probably could have actually been a little bit looser. Um, this was done on five millimeter needles, I think, and it probably should have been a bit tighter. So there you go. This needed to be a bit tighter. This needed to be a little bit looser. This needs to be a little bit looser. The sweater is a really interesting construction. So I'm just gonna stand up so that I can point to where I'm talking about as I'm going. But basically what you're doing is you cast on up here. I used a tubular cast on because I really like the look of a tubular cast on with this type of a neck. Um, but basically you're casting on up here. It's quite a, a wide neck. And on some people it ends up going like this and looking like a bit of a boat. And I really wanted to try to avoid that. Um, hence using slightly smaller needles because in the pattern the body of the sweater is actually knit on US size 10 or a six millimeter needle. So I kept the size of the needle a little bit smaller. I had a slightly tighter gauge ever so slightly um, and that worked it worked out really really well. I don't like really loose big bulky garments. They don't look great on me because I carry my weight on my lower half so it ends up just making me look like a big blob. Um, but it this worked really, really well because there's so much positive ease built into the pattern, if that makes sense. So from there, once you finish this, 
you actually start building up the back neck and you work short rows across the back. So you're working your cables on the front and the back of the sweater. Um, when on the front the right side and the and the wrong side so if you're not comfortable crossing cables on the wrong side just flip the the project around and cross them backwards like you would sort of if you were knitting on the right side but you're just going the other way and then you'll make sure that you'll know that your cables are crossed in the right direction or cross it on the wrong side going the right way but then look on the right side and make sure that you've crossed it in the right direction because it will make a difference um, if these aren't crossed these little oreo oreo cables um, if they're not crossed in the right direction it you can tell it doesn't look right the other and so after you do all of those short rows and you build all of that you come to one of the sides and you actually start building your saddle shoulder and then you do the same thing on the other side and you build your other saddle shoulder there's just great horseshoe type cable that goes all the way down and carries all the way to the cuff. And then you start to build the yokes and you do the front and the back separately because you actually pick up stitches um, so that you have built your saddle and you've built all of this sort of up here and then you start building down here and you actually pick up stitches um, which is really 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 interesting because you as you pick up those stitches then then you can go down and do your body but because you had to build that you have already done you go you have to go back and do your your sleeves so as you build your sweater you've got these sort of this this um, ridge here that develops and you go back and pick up all those stitches to finish off your saddle and then you knit your sleeves and then you go back do the other side and then build out the body. So when you're done your body, which is only about 15, I think mine ended up being, I think my body, I think mine ended up being 13 and a half, almost 14 inches long. Um, and after it's washed and blocked, it'll, it'll, it'll relax even a little bit more. Um, this isn't that much knitting. Like there's only one, two, three, four, five places that you're crossing your cable before you start your, your bottom ribbing. Um, and your sleeves are already done. So when you're done, you're done, which is really, really great. Um, I did go back, I think it was Rebecca who really very helpfully, because I wouldn't have necessarily seen it unless it was on the screen, because when it was in front of me, it was harder to see. Um, she noticed that a couple of the cables in here, some of them were shorter, some of them were longer, and I had mentioned about wanting to make them like get back on track with how um, the stitch count was because I was off by two rows on the back compared to the front. Somehow I lost two rows somewhere in here um, and so I was two rows behind. I actually took the advice from you guys and what you were saying in the chat about making the cables all look the same versus um, trying to fudge them so that I would be at the same point in the pattern. If you're confused just go back and watch the previous episode. Uh, so I went back and I fixed them. I put them back to how they were supposed to be and then what I actually did at the end because you need them to be at the same point when you're ready to start your ribbing because there's decreases that you work across here on the front and the back. So what I did, I very sneaky, those short rows for the win, I worked two short rows. So there's actually a short row worked in here at the back which worked out perfectly that it was on the back because it just further lifts up the back. It just makes it sit even better. Um, you know, by adding those, the, you know, I, I knit across and then I knit back as if it was the wrong, you know, on the rest row and then I knit back again and that brought me up to where I needed to be to do my decrease row. So if you, if I've lost you, um, you can ask me a question or, or like, but for those who are, who are sort of, um, really advanced knitters, you'll, you'll probably be able to kind of follow along with what I'm saying. That is snow crocus. <laughs> It is not a knit for the faint of heart. It is incredibly effective. The finished product is absolutely beautiful. One of the things that I'm very struck by with it is how vintage it looks and feels. It feels like a very 1950s, 1940s kind of sweater, like the with the with the cinched in neckline the cinched in um, ribbing at the at the cuff it feels very a little bit more formal it feels very 1940s um you know a little bit more tailored 
Um, it just, yeah, I really, really like the aesthetic a lot. And um, I actually, um, I was going to wear it for you guys today. I'll wear it next show instead, although I'll probably get way too hot. Um, I... I didn't wear it because it's really hard to speak to stuff when I'm wearing something. Um, I know you guys always, you'll often request like, oh, can we see it on you? Can we see it on you? It's it's really hard to be like, oh, and then there's this, and then there, like, it's just, it's really hard. So um, definitely better on Diana for the first time, and then I'll um, I'll try and, uh, I'm, I'm actually worried it's just going to be way too hot to wear it for one of the podcast episodes. So I might have to wear it for part of the time, and then we'll have to have like an interlude where I get changed. <laughs> So the one thing that I will say about this sweater, uh, it doesn't take a lot of yarn. You can knit it quite with a little bit more. Um, my fabric is a little bit firmer than what's called for in the pattern. Um, if you went up to that six millimeter needle with this yarn combination, it would work beautifully. I don't know what would happen with the neckline. It might become a little bit more relaxed and a little bit bigger. So you might want to size down your needles for the neckline or do some increases before you start the body of the sweater. It might create a little tiny bit of puckering, like a little bit of pleating, but actually on a sweater like this, it would be actually quite, um, it would be quite, uh, what's the word that I'm looking for? Um, pleasing, I think. So think about that um, and, and just kind of playing around a little bit with the neckline so you don't have quite as big, um, um, if you don't like that boat. On some people photographed on Ravelry on their project pages with the slightly bigger boat and a little bit more of a, um, a relaxed ribbing neck um, with the, still the, the, the depth, but more relaxed and a little bit um, more of like a boat neck, it looks really nice. So definitely have a look at some of the photos of other people before you decide um, what you're gonna do with yours. Cause yeah, really, really nice. Yeah, Agent Carter would wear it. <laughs> yeah, totally. Beautiful sweater, I'm really tempted. It, it It's a great, it's a great pattern. It's just, it's 60 pages long, six zero. Um, it's, it's definitely not for the faint of heart, but once you get it, it's not difficult. Um, it's just that there's different sizes on different pages. So what I did, after having a couple of false starts and trying to follow the pattern on one of my devices, I found that it was just too much to keep track of on my device, even though there's links to skip ahead. What I ended up doing, I did print it. Um, I went through the pattern, I read it, which is very unusual for me to read a pattern start to finish. Um, I read the pattern, I went through and I printed the pages that I needed to print for my size. And then I put them in order. I know that sounds really elementary. Oh, put them in order, Rachel, duh. Um, well, I don't often put things in order. Um, if it gets out of order, I kind of tend to just leave stuff. Um, don't do that. <laughs> don't do that um, and then what I did was uh, once I got the hang of the cable because the cable sequence is really easy um, it's not difficult at all um, so once I got the hang of that um, I don't know where my clip went but I had a clip on here and I just kept track of the rest of the pattern that way and this is one of those patterns I'm not gonna throw it out or recycle it I'm gonna hang on to this um, I probably won't make it again anytime soon however I really enjoyed knitting this in the end. In the end, I really, really, I really enjoyed it. It was challenging. It kept me engaged. Um, yes, I had to redo a bunch of it a bunch of times and that was annoying, but I really, really enjoyed it. And I liked the feeling because it's a slightly bigger gauge. It's, it's a worsted weight yarn on four millimeter needles, sorry, on five millimeter needles, US size eight. It goes really quickly. It builds very fast. Um, this is one of those projects that you could, you could knit in a couple of weeks and like feel like, wow, dust the shoulders off. I did that. So really fun. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, that's hilarious, Dion. I want to add a victory pool to your hair, a victory roll to your hair um, to go with the aesthetic. <laughs> Thank you. My hair does kind of, it's very similar. My hair is very light. It's lightening very slowly over time. My hair is lightening. I am very slowly losing my color. 
um, which my mom had already lost hers by 35. So I, I consider myself lucky um, because I'm I'm already 40 and I, I my hair's just starting to lose um, some of its uh, um, really like intense red. Um, but it was getting really, really, really blonde. And I when it gets really blonde, it's because I need a trim and I need to get rid of those split ends and stuff. So then I, you know, it's it sort of, but it, it's definitely, I'm losing that like really, really red, red. So it's definitely changing slowly as I, as I get older. It's okay. It's all part of, part of life. I think that's it for today. I'm going to have to, we're going to have to save community participation. It's huge. I had a really big one prepared for you guys. Um, I wasn't sure how long it would take me to go through the spins that I wanted to share with you guys. And uh, I wasn't sure how long I would take to talk about this because I wanted to do it justice because it is such a special knit. Um, so we'll save community participation. I'll probably release it separately like I did the last one. So um, if you want just some inspiration in the middle of your week and you're looking for something, um, have a look at community participation. The one from last time that kept getting missed and missed and missed and missed. And I just wasn't able to uh, po like get to it because the shows were getting so, so, so long. Um, it is here. Let me see if I can find it. I'll post it in the live chat for you guys. Um, it's here and, uh, yeah, I just want to thank you so, so much for being here and for participating, for participating in chat. Thank you so much. Um, I hope that you guys have a wonderful rest of your week. I will see you next Tuesday, same time, same place for the wool circle with Rebecca. She has a doozy of an episode prepared for you guys. I've already edited it and I'm excited to share that with you guys. Christine says she really enjoyed seeing the community participation as a standalone watch. That's good to know, Christine. Thank you so much for, for telling me that. I appreciate that. Um, we can keep doing that if you guys prefer that and you prefer to keep some of this stuff separate. Um, it's just really an opportunity for me with community participation to like celebrate you guys. That's, that's why I like doing it. Um, you guys share so much and there is so much depth to what you guys um, share that I want the opportunity to put you guys in the limelight, in the spotlight for a while. All right. I think that's everything. Lisa likes it as a standalone too. Good to know. Good to know you guys. Thank you. All right. Until next time, happy spinning, happy knitting, happy all the things. I will see you next time for another episode. Have a great couple of weeks, you guys. Bye everyone.